nearly 15 years. He has booked tours for the likes of Trampled by Turtles, Galen Lee, Lucy Wainwright Roche and Susie Roche, The Ike Riley Assassination, The Honey Dogs, Sid Straw, and many more. Grossman founded Green Music Source and has dedicated himself to merging his music business expertise with education. Ladies and gentlemen, Craig Grossman. No? <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, I liked it better before. Woo, great. All right, so uh, I am here today to talk about some uh, uh, proven methods from an agent's standpoint uh, of uh, how to successfully reach and get those gigs, especially when you're, you're brand new or a little bit newer in the, in the industry. How many of you have been on the road before for, I mean, outside of your home market? I mean to tour, quite a few, great. How many of you want to tour? <laughs> I hope so. I think I'm competing with uh, that, there's another room where there's like a, something about, uh, you never have to tour again. And I think I was like, <laughs> really? Really, I have to compete with that? Well that's okay, you guys are, you're in the right place, exactly. Uh, the history of touring is, it's really interesting what's happened the last few years when it comes to being on the road. If you haven't noticed already, probably some of your favorite bands are touring more and more. Raise your hand if you've noticed that. They're out on the road a lot more often. Does anyone want to guess why? Money? Because it's not, they're not making money off of royalties anymore, right? It's a, become a, a, an income stream that has actually replaced uh, touring has become an inc income stream that has replaced royalties in other words, for record sales, essentially. So you're seeing larger artists playing smaller venues, which is uh, a little bit daunting for people like me who's, who book really small. I mean, I, re I typically book venues of anywhere between 100 and 500 capacity rooms. It's getting more and more competitive out there, which means you have to work smarter, and of course you have to work further ahead. It wasn't really all that long ago uh, when, especially in the early 70s, which I guess is a little bit, little ways ago, around my era, when I was born, the uh, bands would go and play, you'd have like Led Zeppelin and The Who, and you know, three or four really huge arena rock bands would play for, even though it was the early 70s, it was still not very expensive, five to ten dollars a ticket. They weren't touring to, those were the good old days, right? They weren't touring uh, to make money directly from ticket sales. They were touring to advertise their album, to sell their record, right? This is essentially inverted on itself now. It's not that you're not selling records on the road, you're probably selling more records on the road than you're selling anywhere else. Because the, overall, the same thing has to happen today that happened yesterday. You have to get the message out there, right? This is why we tour, or this is a big reason we tour. Another reason we tour, of course, is because people, I talk to musicians all the time, artists all the time, and say, we, I have to tour, I have to tour. What does that mean, I have to tour? The fire in the belly, you have to get out there. What you're trying to do, of course, is get your message ac across to whatever area you're going to. You're probably starting really small. If you live, I'm from Minneapolis. I live in Minneapolis, I'm sending artists to Chicago, I'm sending them to Madison, Milwaukee, et cetera and just doing what we call weekend warrior things. And then we're gonna to try to expand on that based on the reaction of the markets that we go to, based on the, 
on the, um, on the approach. My job as an agent, and your job now if you're, if, you, if you're booking yourself, is to just get the best possible show for you based on where you're at with your career, basically. And that's a very simple concept. I'm gonna say that again. My job as an agent, and your job if you're booking yourself, is to get the best possible show based on where you're at in your career. So if you're brand spanking new and have never, I mean, I think at least half of you raised your hand, have never toured before, what does that mean? What does that mean? It's kind of tough, you're starting from zero. And that's what I wanna talk about today when I'm talking about the different methods of approaching um, booking. Getting back to some of the reasons that we the reasons that we tour, not why we tour. Why we tour is the fire in the belly, we have to, we want to get our message out there. But we want to start with what you know and who you know when you're going. Uh, my big rule whenever an artist approaches me and says they want to go to whatever place they want to go to, whether it's from Minneapolis to New York City and back, or just to Chicago, a little less ambitious, my first question is always, when will you go back to that furthest market? So for example, my artist wants to go to Minneapolis, or go from Minneapolis to New York City, when are you gonna go back? It's a chess game, really. Simple rule, there is no reason for you to go to New York City unless you have a solid plan, and the resources, frankly, to follow up and go back as quickly as possible. As quickly as possible means, preferably, even if it's that far away, preferably within probably eight to 12 weeks. Because what ends up happening, of course, is you go to New York, you play in front of 20 people, you make a few fans, you sell some merch, but people tend to forget, especially in larger cities like New York, that's just one example, but it really doesn't matter which city it is. They tend to forget, and you have to, it's a branding thing, right? You have to keep hitting the nail over, head, over the head until you can finally get you know, a respectable audience in that market. And that's how you're developing those markets. That's how you're building those markets. So you have to keep this in mind. When you're a new artist, you don't always have the luxury of having press right away, of course. I mean, that's the, the uh, catch-22. How do I get press for my band or for my, myself as an artist when I have never toured before? I can't afford to hire a big publicist. And frankly, even if you do are able to pay a big publicist, they might not be able to, to, to help you if you don't have any story built. So, of course, nowadays, we don't have much of an excuse since the invention of that thing called, what is it called? Oh, the internet, the internet. That's a pretty important thing right now. It's kind of a double-edged sword, unfortunately, because everyone, of course, caught on to that trend, the internet, right away, and realized that they could utilize it to their advantage, so there's more competition, of course. But well, what I'm talking about here is marketing yourself before you even get out there. So you can start to create a buzz in any given market. And more important than that, because sometimes it, it often actually happens by accident, you have to look at the analytics, so to speak. You have to look at where there might be a trend. There might be uh, people that, in a certain market that are asking for you. And one big thing I'm trying to get at here is to, to do some research what resources are out there, start with what you know, start with who you know. I tell people all the time, if you have a, a, an, an aunt that likes rock and roll music that lives in Chicago, maybe that aunt that likes rock and roll music is a seed to start something in that market because she's going to come to the show, hopefully bring some of her wonderful, crazy, eccentric friends, and you'll you know, be able to sort of grow off of that. I think a misconception people have is that they have to go to markets, especially larger markets, and they have to draw 100 people on their own right away. Not everybody thinks that, but I think a lot of people think that that kind of pressure is on them when they're trying to get the show from the promoter, that they have to deliver that much. And truth be told, that's not the case. I actually was in a panel yesterday about booking your Legends A and B, about booking your, uh, booking a local, venue or something like that, I forgot what it was called exactly, but they made the good point of they're not necessarily looking for giant numbers right away. 
promoters, talent buyers are looking for the long picture. If you come into a venue in any, any given market, even a larger market like New York or Chicago, and you draw you know, 20 to 30 people, and you're like, damn, I only, we only had 20 people at the show. We don't even know who half of them were, but we only had 20 people at the show. That's still gonna be numbers that you can use for your history, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And that's gonna be something that's gonna be really helpful for you to build, and believe it or not, that will impress, that will get you back into the venue, the most important thing. Because that, of course, is ultimately the goal. Getting back to that rule I said about, okay, you, the artist, wants to go to New York City, you want me to send you there, or you want to send yourself there, think about when you're going to follow up on that, when you're going to be able to do more damage. Probably make more sense later when I talk a little bit more about merch sales as well. So in other, you know, re some of the reasons that people tour, of course, they get a little bit of radio play, it doesn't have to necessarily be top 40 or AAA, but just some kind of little seed. We'll talk a bit about anchor dates. How many of you have heard of anchor dates? Of course, an anchor date is, that's a main, really, the main reason to tour. You want to find that date that might get you a little bit more money, might help you to afford the tour, and you want to work around that date. So wherever it is, you're kind of going to route, route around it. It's all about getting the message out there either way, so whether or not you have any buzz or not, or whether you have any radio player or not, that's really what, what it comes down to, is you need to get your message out there, even to a few people at a time. I think another mistake people make is they assume that they need to do uh, just larger markets. They need to bounce from Chicago to Cleveland, DC, New York, whatever, whatever you want to route. And that's actually something, I'm sure some of you in the audience uh, have experienced this. You're going to probably have more success if you try to book smaller markets. Of course, college markets are great, but they're harder to get. Markets that you maybe haven't even, cities, markets that you maybe haven't even heard of before. Those are the ones that tend to be, for smaller and for beginning artists, to be the most successful, like out of the gate. Those are the markets where people show up and there's, yeah, you, you, you're with me. <laughs> and there's 100 people there and you're like, why are there 100 people here? What's the reason? There's nothing else to do. There's no competition at all, exactly. Uh, but it's really nice because they tend to be really appreciative. I mean, we all know it's better to play in front of like 15, 20 people. I come from a musician's background, touring background myself, to play in front of a very small audience of really appreciative, you know, you got me too. I'm, I like it. <laughs> I'm going to call you up here later. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a lot, a lot more comfortable. It's a lot better to play in front of that small, appreciative audience. I had a, actually an example of that many years ago when I was touring full time. And I played in front of a, in a, <laughs> this is my only time I've ever been to Houston. I hope I'm not offending anybody here. And maybe the only time I ever go to Houston. Because I went to Houston, played in front of a, about 500 people. I'm probably exaggerating, but it was at least 490 people. <laughs> All in this, you know, ready to go. Like, I was like, oh, wow, we're going to bring the rock on. And we were from Minneapolis, and they thought we were supposed to be this band called The Replacements. I mean, they didn't really think that, but they thought we should sound like them, because everybody from Minneapolis should sound like them. And we didn't sound like them, and so we really pissed off a lot of people, and disappointed a lot of people, and it was, it was actually kind of hostile. It was really awful. So I always think of that when I think about the playing in front of a small audience is better. So again, don't ignore those smaller markets, the territory markets, as the, the agencies like to call them. They are really important. They're not just important to get you to bridge across from one place to another. I've seen people build careers off of mainly playing smaller markets. It's kind of akin to, uh, how many of you ever uh, played, uh, I know a couple of you in the audience, have played uh, house concerts before? Yeah. It's kind of a more of a religious experience than playing a, a dumb venue, isn't it? It's a lot, a lot better. Um, so when you're, when you're preparing for a, a tour, first tour or a hundredth tour, you have to kind of, of course, know where you're going. You have to know what the right venues are. You have to obviously pay a lot of attention to capacity. We're going to get into it in a minute, the, the methods I wanted to talk about today uh, that I feel are effective. You just want to make sure that you're, you're, you're not going to go into a venue that doesn't make sense. I mean, there are talent buyers out there who will say, sure, come on in and play. And then you go and you're like, it's like Spinal Tap, right? You're opening for a puppet show or something. It doesn't really make any sense at all. Um, 
There's no, you know, it's hard to understand why you're there. And you're not totally wasting your time, but you're wasting at least most of your time in a situation like that. So, of course, you want to be prepared. Everybody's anxious to just be able to play whatever venue will we'll have them, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll accept them. And that's fine, especially right away. You want to see what sticks. Remember that you're searching for a market. Something I'll probably repeat throughout the hour is you're, you're not, that first time, first couple times you're out there on the road, you are trying to impress the industry. You're not trying to impress, you're not trying to just draw, you're not going to draw a thousand people a night. You're trying to make sure that you get in front of the right people I've seen this happen many, many times where the bartender may literally be the only person at the venue, but that bartender is really into what you're doing. That bartender buys like three copies of your CD or your vinyl or whatever you're selling, T-shirts, and what that bartender does, does anybody want to guess what that bartender does? They tell everybody. That bartender has more influence than you might think. They, and especially if they go back to the lukewarm, what we call talent buyer, the person who's the gatekeeper that got you the gig in the first place, and they didn't really take you very seriously, they just got you in there for the heck of it, they knew you weren't going to draw anybody or thought you weren't going to draw anybody, they're cynical. But now, what the bartender has done is gone and said, you've got to get these guys back and you've got to get them opening for something, like so that they do not come here and fall on their face next time. So they come in here and actually have a good show, and there's many examples of that. And that's something that you have to do, so it's always good to make sure uh, has anybody ever used um, Indie on the Move before? Not as many as I thought. It's a Indie on the Move. Sorry I don't have any visuals today. It's just me up there. It's very frightening. Uh, and I'm up here, too. It's like Indie on the Move, I-N-D-I-E on the move dot com. Yeah, you're not in your heads. It's great. It's a lifesaver. My agency actually relies on Indie on the Move more than we do on Polestar. Oh, God, there's probably people from Polestar here. Um, more than we, than we rely on, on other, you know, bigger, um, what do you, booking venue databases, promoter databases, what I want to call them. That's what it is, is a venue promote. It's a venue database, mainly. I mean, it's the main thing. They do other stuff, too. So you can literally search any market, any state market, and find out, even there's even a star rating, you can find out what, um, what the capacities of the rooms are, whether the venue requires you to carry your own PA or not, which is really important, especially most people that are just going out and showcasing aren't, aren't carrying their own equipment if they're just trying to do a 50 minute set a night or whatnot. So it's really uh, a really great resource. It, unfortunately, I don't know what it costs now. Does anybody know? It used to be free. I'm grandfather. What is it? Indie on the move. Is it still free? Well, you might, you might be grandfathered in, because now I think if you sign on new, you have to pay a little something. Oh, it's just the pro version. Right. But it's 12, 12 a month? That's not bad. That's totally worth it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it does give you the colleges. I had to pay for the college database separately, and <laughs> it didn't really work for me. Well, I didn't really use it that much. That's good to know, $12 a month, very much worth, worth it. Uh, it's, I mean, I, the aforementioned Polestar, there's a thing called Celebrity Access. Again, nothing against them, but quite frankly, I find Indie on the Move to be much more effective, more, uh, I, I, it's weird. When we've used other databases, we get, you get, you know, you, you, if you email people, of course, you get the, the people that aren't there anymore, you get the bounce back, and that doesn't happen with Indie on the Move very often at all. Usually, I'm not saying they always get back to you, but you don't get, a lot of bounce back emails, so it's more effective. You're reaching people, hopefully, anyway. Uh, when you're looking at venues, you're not just looking at the size of the venue, the capacity, and making sure that you're not wasting your time. And you're not going to get a show as a headliner or even just your first time at a, in a market or at a venue at a 1,500 or 1,000 capacity room anyway. So, of course, that's common sense. You want to look for the smaller rooms. If you're a solo artist or, or maybe just a duel, don't have drums, you might want to look for coffee shops at first when you're going out there or that type of venue. Everybody's like, well, I want to play listening rooms, listening rooms. Well, you have to wait a while. You have to get the audience that's going to listen to you before you do that. So you start with these things. Ages is another big thing. Of course, coffee shops are usually all ages. Might seem, well, I guess it's not strange, but you, you, if you go out and play all bars, but you're playing like, you know, a really cool, slick type of synth pop, you're probably going to 
not necessarily be wasting your time all the time. It's never a waste of time, but you want to try to find venues that have all ages or at least 18 up. Every state is different. Anybody from Iowa? Nobody's from Iowa? In this room, nobody is from Iowa? I'm the closest thing to, I'm from Minnesota, so I'm from Iowa. The, Iowa has, this, it's 19 and up is the ages. I don't know if you've ever noticed that when you're out there booking. It's the strangest thing. But you just have to, to keep that in mind because if your message, again, it comes down to the message. If your message is you're trying to play you know, really cool mu danceable music for a hip audience, then all those 21 up places, some of them might work, but it's better to at least gear towards the places that are going to, to be a little more liberal all ages let more people in, basically. You also, I said, I think earlier, you have to, to start with who you know. And what I mean by that, going back from the, either whether it's the aunt that lives in Chicago, the cool aunt that might come out, or if there's someone in the industry directly that you know, or even just friends that you know in the market that you think can help out, you can call them up and say, hey, can you get 10 of your buddies to come and you know, pay $5 to come see us play at, at whatever venue? Uh, that stuff is all, all really important, but I think more important than that for all of this stuff is to make sure that you keep it organized, keep it close to the chest. Uh, you have to use a database. I'm always, when I teach back in Minneapolis, and I'm, I, I ask students, you know, do you know what a database is? And they don't know what a database is. Do you guys know what a database is? Can I assume you do a database? Uh, you know, even if it's an Excel spreadsheet or something, keep track or you know, really your Gmail account or your Yahoo account is a database, technically. Keep track of, of those people, because hopefully it's gonna be harder and harder to keep track of them as you move on, because you're gonna be constantly you know, accumulating people, collecting people and, and networking with people. And you wanna keep that, that going so that you can look when you sit down to, to, to set up a tour and say, oh, well, you know, look, look, look here, we know like five people in this, in this market, small or, or big, and maybe we should anchor something there, or maybe we should start there, or at least we should play there if it's reachable, if it's accessible to us. Let's get into these methods, these three methods. As an agent and an agency, this is what I do every single day. I'm looking at three ways to reach out to the markets. I'm gonna say market, meaning the city, and do everything I can to get someone to say yes. But actually, when I'm relationship building, I want you guys to keep this in mind because I'm gonna talk about pitching in a little bit. And actually, I'm gonna call it volleying, like a volleyball, serving is what I'm gonna call it. You, you have to remember that when, when you're starting to reach out for a new relationship, your ultimate goal is, of course, to get them to say yes to what you want, obviously, to get you that show, that coveted show. But I think it's important to keep in mind that when you're first starting, you should really just have the relationship in mind. Because what has probably happened to each of you in this room, or a lot of you, is you reach out, and you don't hear back, and you don't hear back. And of course, how are we communicating? Email. I get people all the time that say, well, I emailed Joe Schmo, you know, in Madison, Wisconsin, to get into the, uh, you know, high noon saloon or whatever venue, and they didn't write back. And I'm like, okay, do you know Joe Schmo? No. Did you, when did you email him? A week ago. Did you email him again? No. We, we always talk about cold calling. When you call someone the first time, of course. Now we call it, or at least I call it, cold emailing, basically. It's the same thing, except for, unfortunately, it's colder. <laughs> it's a lot colder. And what I mean by that is that if I'm sending out a one-way communication to someone who is getting probably 100 to 150 to 200 emails every couple of days, or maybe even 100 emails per day, this happens. And I've never met you before, and you've never met me before, what's going to probably happen? If the email doesn't go to spam, I don't want to even talk about that right now. What's probably going to happen is they're either never gonna see the email or they're not going to care, frankly. I mean, not that they don't care, but they just don't have time to pay attention to it unless they know who you are. Obviously, the subject line of your email should be, um, you know, 
eye-grabbing, but not too eye-grabbing. Don't, don't get too liberal with that. Um, you know, you kind of got to be businesslike when you haven't, haven't met anybody. So the first method, or the first thing, or the, the most common way that we get artists, or I should say we get shows for our artists on our roster, is through talent buyers. You've all heard of talent buyers? Name uh, kind of implied, it's the gatekeeper at the venue, and that's important to keep in mind. It's the person at the venue that is going to say yes or no, essentially. So if you do this thing I said earlier, I call it volleying, but we'll start out with a serve instead of a pitch, where I send the email out to Joe Schmo at the High Noon Saloon in Madison, Wisconsin, but I've never met Joe Schmo, and I have to expect that Joe Schmo probably won't get back to me right away unless I have an existing relationship, if it is a cold, in fact, a cold email. What I, of course, have to do is be persistent. I have to figure out a, a, a way to, you know, keep reaching out. And I have people ask me all the time, well, how often should I do it? Am I being a pest? Here's my theory on that, by the way. If I don't know Joe Schmo, I can't really be a pest, right? Joe Schmo, if, until, I mean, I've had this happen a lot where I've emailed several times to, to anybody, a talent buyer or whatever, promoter, and finally, uh, after several tries, tries, they do get back to me, they apologize, and they say, okay, you know, now we can talk, and then you start that volleying process, I'll talk about in a second. It's not necessarily that they're going to give you the show that you want right away, but hopefully they respond. Here's my theory. When you reach out to anyone, for anything in the music industry, it doesn't have to be a talent buyer, and I've had this happen a lot. Tell, raise your hand if this has happened to you. You send an email out, whether it's a day or two or Two hours later, you get a one-word response. What's that word? No. Period. Has that ever happened to anybody or something like that? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes they're not. Not interested, exactly. Not interested is uh, a little hard of an objective to overcome. But I still would recommend you have nothing, nothing to lose, especially you're representing yourself what you what you want to do if they say no, even if they say not interested, especially if they say no, not interested is a different topic we can get to in a second. If they say uh, no, that you of course want to assume that just means that they don't have the date that you're asking for. I have a rule, um, I wish I could put it up on the screen. I call it the 2-4 rule. It's my rule, I call this a 2-4 rule, and it should go in the subject line Ask for two, we call avails, available dates, no less than two dates on your tour routing. Even if you think there's only one date that will work in that market, ask for at least two and no more than four dates. The problem with asking for only one date is you're, especially when you are brand new, is you're really pigeonholing a little too much. They ask, uh, asking for more than four dates, you start to look a little desperate, of course, and that's not good. You don't want to look like that, of course. You want a professional way to do it, but of course, if I even ask for four available dates and I get that no period or even not interested to a degree, I can go back to them. I don't have anything to lose if I've never met them before, and I can say, does anybody know? What's the next possible date that's open on either side of this? It's amazing to me how often that works. I, I'm, I, I'm amazed at how often. What I mean by that works is this is the volley part. They come back and they, they give me a date. They give me another date, or even if they don't, the goal here, after I've served, I'm not a sports person, can you tell? I just don't know these analogies. But after I've served that volleyball, or whatever it is, tennis ball, um, I want to keep especially in email, because I'm not, you know, I mean, sometimes we're calling, but often we're not, most often we're not. I want to keep that volley going back and forth, because the more that volley goes back and forth, the closer I'm going to get, even if I don't get the date I want for, for my band, the more of a relationship is going to be building. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, you put the, wait, did you put the, your name? Did you put the stereo RV? 
The, what, the, oh, the one date you want? Yeah, that's good, that's, that's what I do. I mean, what I do, and I put the company name and I put the two to four available dates, usually. When you, when you, when you, get the, when you start to build that relationship way past the volley, and you really know that talent buyer pretty well or that promoter pretty well, you, um, it's really surprising. You, get, you can get more liberal. You can say, do you got anything in August for me? Because <laughs> they, they know you. It doesn't matter at that point. But when you're starting out and you don't want to look desperate, but you, and you want to be very, it's going to just make you look more organized, frankly. You want to be as specific as you can. That two, four, uh, but what you're talking, you, I think what you're asking is, is that subject line because it is a good yeah, subject line, in my opinion. Yep, 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 yep. Yeah, booking inquiry is good. If it's a brand new, uh, I guess we're in the question and answer field. I haven't even finished my, if you're in a brand new, um, my, my spiel. If you're in a brand, I don't even remember what I was gonna say. You had a question? <laughs> it's okay. I, Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's part of the volley. If we get to that point finally where they do start saying, okay, we can hold a date, or everybody knows second holds, third holds, it's kind of a more complicated thing. But the protocol, I was going to go into this in a little bit, but this is just as good a time as any. The protocol is you get the hold or holds. If you're lucky, you might get a couple of choices, which is great for your routing, for obvious reasons that you can go back and pick the best date for your routing. You get the holds. Do not confirm, even when you're brand new, never been to that market before, do not confirm until you've entertained some kind of an offer. It could be a very informal thing, but you ask for an offer. You can say, okay, hey, we are going to, we want to focus on, you know, August 27th, 2017, whatever. We want to focus on that date. Can you please send an offer? Simple language. Some people, new artists are like, well, what do you mean? The talent buyer might come back and say, what do you need? Which is kind of a scary, have you ever been there? Because I actually call this a pissing match. Nobody wants to throw out the first number. Uh, agents never want to throw out the first number. I mean, they have their reserves. They know what their artists need. You as an artist know what you need. And that's tough to know. I think you have to re remember, too, of course, when you're brand new, you're, you're worth zero. You just should never pay to play. But you're worth nothing until you can prove something. But you're not worth a crappy door deal. You know, you're worth a good door deal. And that's, unfortunately, a whole different talk. I'm happy to answer any of those questions later. But you do want to assess what you're worth. But does that answer your question? Sort of? you, yeah. It's OK. You're way ahead of me. Um, it depends. I, as an agency, we like, we have someone that contracts in our office, so it's easy for me to say, uh, you know, it's all automated signatures, et cetera. Uh, I probably, our, our point of return on, I mean, we book a lot of shows, but I mean, I would say it's probably maybe 50% of the, con maybe 50% of the contracts come back, whether it's even some bigger shows. I always say that if there's at least a dollar guarantee, you should contract it whenever. But contracts, remember, a kind of a different topic, but contracts are about the agreement. It doesn't matter what the terms are, even if it's just tips. It's to make sure that both parties understand. You want, it, we have to remember that time is as important as money when it comes to this. If you're supposed to play at 9 p.m. for 45 minutes, you plan to play at 9 p.m. for 45 minutes. Don't play for 44, don't play for 46. May not be easy to do, but play for 45 minutes. You want to, especially when you're first out there, you want to be doing it. But yes, I think you should ask for it, because it, again, it kind of ties into what I'm talking about now with the protocol. Hold the date, get the offer, confirm the date. The protocol makes you look professional. And you are professional. But I do know a lot of artists, in fact, I know a lot of agencies, I won't name any names, that don't do all of this, and they aren't taken as seriously. You will be taken a lot more seriously. Because what's going to happen, I mean, Again, it's the chess plane. You're not going to be dealing with small shows where you're playing coffee houses for tips only forever. You're going to be doing, you know, 
you're going to be getting bigger, hopefully. And, it's going to, and, and then you're going to definitely need contracts. So it's better to start, it out, start out professionally right away. Uh, before we go on, we will have a little bit of a question and answer time later, too, if I do believe. Talent buyers, these three methods I'm talking about. Talent buyers is the most common way that we reach out to get shows. And a talent buyer, just so you understand the definition, works for typically a specific venue. Okay? Bluebird in, in Nashville has a, has a talent buyer. First Avenue, back where I live, has a talent buyer. It's not always the case, but oftentimes you have to kind of presume the talent buyer is just interested in getting people in, playing in their venue that are able to draw the most, so of course they can make the most money for their venue, basically. That's their job. They're not necessarily that emotionally involved in promoting and marketing your show. They're more relying on you. I mean, they'll hang posters up if you send them, hopefully. They don't always do that. But they're not really going to be, you know, hitting the street. They might do a couple social networking posts, you know, something like that, but it's not going to be a crazy amount of marketing. The next method, the next people that we reach out to, and it's a little rare, and it depends on where you're at in your career, are promoters. And we use the... the, the uh, um, titles, promoter and talent buyers interchangeably all the time, but they're very separate things, very separate things. The promoters are taking a risk when they bring you into the venue, which of course stands to reason they might not want to take a chance on you when you're brand new, but you shouldn't assume that. The promoters are more emotionally involved. It's the opposite of what I just said with talent buyers. They're more emotionally involved in marketing and promoting the show because they are taking that risk, usually for money, for reputation, et cetera, et cetera. They typically are working for, they might work for just one, they might not, they probably don't work for a venue, they work independently often, there might be a company or one person, but they are going to find the best venue for you in your career, just like what I talked about what an agent does. They're gonna find the best venue. But if you have something that you, and you guys all know that you, you're offering something really hot, don't necessarily shy away from trying to get relationships early on with promoters. Of course, you've got to find them, but you can find them. Go after those promoters because they are looking at the long game. If they think that you really have something cool to offer, and they think that you're going to develop fast in the market, they want to get on the ground floor, essentially. And so it's not like they're going to give you a headlining show, but they're going to hopefully get you on to something where you're gonna go into that market and you're gonna play in front of a few hundred people or whatever, or maybe, maybe more, because you're opening. You're opening for no money, 50 bucks, 25 bucks, 100 bucks, whatever. It doesn't matter, it's about the exposure. Getting your message out there, the more exposure you can get, obviously, the better. Now the third method, the third way that we get shows is I think the most effective way to do it for new artists, and that is through other artists. Networking, show trades. How many of you have ever worked with show trades? A show trade simply means, as it sounds, I am in a certain market, I'm drawing okay, you gotta make sure that you're drawing fairly well, and you're looking for an artist in another market so you can invite them to your market, that's the protocol, invite them first, so that they can play in front of your audience and hopefully get that needed exposure for, to, to increase their fan base. And of course, you want to do the same thing with them. It's not about money, although usually it's all equal. The cool show trades, you sometimes you'll get paid more than you maybe necessarily would get paid because the artist is in, in, investing to have you come up open for them, and they can do the same. Now, easier said than done. How do we network with other artists? I don't want you to spend money that you don't have. You can't spend money that you don't have. But if you want to, one thing that, that I sometimes recommend, if it's close enough to your region, maybe you can drive there, do a little research weekend. Go to that market, that, maybe that larger market, and go to a few select shows. Of course, you're going to be looking for bands or artists that are similar. Not, they don't have to be the same as you, but they're a little bit similar. Try to look for bands that are doing about what you're doing in the industry. Not an exact science, but basically, where you're at, or maybe just a little bit, it's like a coattail thing, a little bit above where you're at. Go meet them. Go to their show. Hopefully like their show. Don't lie. Don't lie. Um, <laughs> I, I don't like to. 
hard for me to say I like something if I don't like it. And then you can start that conversation. Artists, as a touring artist myself, I, I learned this when I started my agency, artists speak a certain language, right? You're all artists. There's a certain language, we don't know what that language is called. Artist language? I don't know. You know how to speak to other artists. Artists want to help, help each other out, especially when, it, when it's crossing over into other territories and other markets, other cities. They want to help each other out. So, you know, no one's shy about it. You go and you do it, and you start again with that database. You start collecting these people, essentially. Any questions? Yes. Uh, we got like 15 minutes. I can. Hey, so. Yeah. Uh, my name is Elena Lacayo. I do bilingual folk rock out of Washington, D.C. My band's name is Elena y los Fulanos. So as you can hear, uh, what we do is a little bit out of the mainstream. And I think, you know, so I've started going on tour. And one of the things that I struggle with a little bit um, is finding, I mean, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this, but finding venues that are, it's a, where, where I don't show up and it's like, what am I doing here because this venue, because I do bilingual music. There's not a ton of bilingual venues, mm -hmm. right? And so, right. and, 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 and it, it, since it's bilingual, I do stuff in English, so it can be accessible to other people, but it's like when like a Latino person or someone who speaks Spanish comes to my show, my ability to sell them merch yeah. and engage them is yeah. much greater. And so um, I have a lot of friends in DC, there's a lot of folk artists, and a lot of them are kind of the people that there's not like a big bilingual scene in DC per se, um, which has been great for me locally. But um, but when I go to other places, um, I've been trying to do like this exchange thing. I started a, a house venue at my house, which I recommend for everybody. If you have the ability to do- It's a great networking. It's great because yeah. you can offer whenever you go on tour, you can offer, hey, if you're ever in DC, which yeah. is a really hard place to get a gig. Yeah. I can be like, yo, I can host you if you help me out with this show. That's um, really cool. So I've been, I've been trying to do that, but I guess, I, I guess I just have, yeah, that's my general question, like, about being a bilingual artist, and it's a, kind of a niche, but Very I don't much. know. I guess I just, I don't know. I'm like, I'm, I feel like there's potential, but it's hard to kind of find the, the people that I need to be in with, and maybe it's just playing at shows and then people showing up and being like you would be good with other people which has happened as well but i just was wondering if you had any kind of thoughts or advice well the the niche thing is great I mean, we were my whole agency is based on all sorts of niches and i i've realized a couple of years ago actually that's what sustains us is to you know this and of course go in and trying to find different things i don't have much experience at all with the bilingual aspect you're talking about but have you ever tried to, to reach out, social networking, try to, I think what it comes down to is instead of trying to find something, is reaching out, because again, with that cool little trend that we have that's still going called the internet, it's really nice to have that as a tool. It, have, I, it reminded me when you said house concerts, because I have artists that will, if we're having a hard time getting a certain weekend booked, or maybe it's too close, like just a month away or so, they'll reach out to their fans, and all of a sudden, eh, I'll host a house concert. People have never hosted house concerts before. It's not dissimilar to what you're talking about, to reach out and say, hey, do you know a place in your market, maybe a venue, or do you know something, an opportunity, or maybe they will come out with a house concert. That would be, I think, the most effective way. It is, it is, it is. It, it very much is whatever sticks. I actually use that, that, that a lot. I mean, you can't be too choosy at first. Hopefully you get a couple highlights here, here and there that, that will work for you. I think what's more important is that you, again, of course you're going to be self-aware, but be really hyper-aware of what goes on every night. Don't just look at the, you know, there's, oh, I gave the one bartender example, which I see so much, but that bartender was, you know, was spreading the word, basically, and it turned out to be the, you know, the key to our, our success in coming back to that market. And I think that you have to remember that there's going to be victories in everything, or pretty much everything. There's some dismal gigs. I mean, I book bands who go through some dismal gigs all the time. 
And they don't always tell me about it. They'll, or, you know, there's two different, some artists will tell you about all the bad things only, some artists will tell you about only the good things, some won't tell you anything. Um, but I think that if you're keeping track, even writing down like a tour diary of every single victory, because then you could be like, oh, I saw, you know, th this little shining light came through and I think I can go back and make something out of that, which is really, really cool. I guess we got more questions. Uh, yeah, yeah, hey, hello. I'll try to spread it around the room as much That's great. Hey, my name is Trish and um, I love the information that you've given. Uh, for the past few years, I have been doing this singing in bars kind of thing, uh -huh. and that is a tough gig, um, every one of them. But my background mm. is in musical theater and jazz, mm. and so I would be more inclined to play m like 54 Below in, uh, in New York or Cafe Carla, mm. those kinds yeah. of venues. Yep. The booking process that you're talking about, and I wrote down as much as I could <laughs> in uh, my phone. Yeah, I have um, the visuals. Yeah, is, um, is the booking process the same when you're playing um, n clubs like that, sit-down clubs and sit-down theaters, like a 500-seat theater, a 1,000-seat theater? Is the booking process the same? Um, or do you, are you familiar with working with oh, that, yeah. that genre Absolutely. and that kind of yeah, thing? Absolutely, yeah, for sure. Because it's, it's, a, it's, it's a little different when people are actually going to come into a sit-down, like an actual theater, oh, say like a Sanger so theater. The yeah, right. and they're going to sit there and stare at you, which, is com oh. which was weird. When I first started playing gigs at bars, I'm like, these people aren't looking at me. What, <laughs> what's going on? You know, they're not yeah. paying attention. They're doing their own thing. And so I know it's a, it's a completely different world, um, yeah. but the booking process for the dinner clubs and theaters. It's, it's no different. It is no different. It's just different people. Uh, you have to be ready for it, obviously. When you're doing this, the hard work you're doing now, playing the bars the last three years, don't give up. Keep doing it until you finally, and this gets into the collecting, I was going to talk about this in a second. This is a good time to talk about it. Collecting data, more collecting data. Making sure that you play that bar, and what's more important, by the way, I want to make sure I don't get out of here without saying this. You're, when you're first starting, you need to look at the merch sales that you have way more than you need to look about how many people were in the room. It's back to that Houston story I told earlier. 500, you know, how many of those people bought our music? Probably none. I don't remember, but point, and that's when people were buying music too, by the way. It's a long time ago. You have to, to, to really look at that because I always actually ask artists, even though I don't get any commission from it, I ask artists, newer artists, developing artists, for their merch sales numbers because it gives me a real sense of how they're doing in a market. If I have them opening a tour for someone, let's say they're playing in front of three to 400 people a night, but they're, I, I'm looking at their merch numbers, and especially the trends in individual markets, and I see in New York City that they sold, you know, two, three hundred dollars worth of merch, and I can, I can start to relate about what the response was from the audience. And so when you're new and you're like, well, none of these people are listening to me, but maybe, the, maybe some are. And I don't know how you personally are co connecting to your audience. Of course, we, that's really important to do, or connecting to the potential audience. But you need to look, and again, the numbers don't have to be huge. You play in front of those 50 people at the bar, frankly, they're not all there to see you, or maybe, maybe none of them are there to see you, but they're there to drink or whatever. But you've hooked some, you can get a sense of that and collect that history because you need that to start building, to get into those bigger theaters or those sit-down places you're talking about. The method isn't any different. You're still giving a little bit of the data, whether you're brand, don't ever lie about your numbers. You know, whether you're new, or you've been around for a while and have some type of an audience. You start to play, maybe before those theaters, you start to play uh, bars where it's more of a ticketed thing. And you're averaging a 10 to $15 or whatever price, and you get the numbers from those ticket sales, and then you can go, and again, the numbers don't have to be huge, and you can see based on the mix of the talent you have and what that history is, what the actual numbers are. That's what talent buyers or promoters are looking at to see about whether to take a risk, or they might even be like, hey, if you're drawn like that, you would be a really great you know, match. I need, I need support on this night, I'm not gonna pay you much, but you're gonna get something. And then, that's another networking opportunity. All of a sudden, you're playing those places you want, those theaters you want, but you know, you're not headlining, you're just there, and being there is gonna be the biggest thing for you to build that future relationship. But the method, is, to answer your question, the methods aren't any different, as, as far as approach is concerned. Where are we? Yes. Hi, Craig. Thanks for everything. Uh, yes. Richard McDesey, Empower Music and Arts. Uh, we represent uh, artists and um, 
songwriters who dedicate the music to positive personal and social change. So we're kind of nice. a message-driven yeah. uh, record label. But my question's not related to that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's about sponsorships. Like we have artists who have Martin sponsorships or Bose sponsorships mm -hmm. that provide their PAs for them and their guitar strings and, and things like that. Does, does the promoter or does that fall anywhere in your scope of what what uh, you offer as far as a tour of finding sponsorships, sponsors for the artists? Uh, Yamaha, as, far, as far as what we do as my agency? Yeah, uh, the promoters or the yeah. venue. Uh, promoters are usually involved in that. Again, the difference between a talent buyer and a promoter, uh, talent buyers work their butts off, but they're not as emotionally invested in this, the specific show. They want more for the, the good thing to come to them that they just want to set that all up. The promoter, however, is going to be building something more and they might get involved in sponsorships. They don't always do it. We, as an agency, we don't do it. I don't even, I think that's what you were sort of asking. I was, I, yeah. I didn't know if it's up to yeah, not, the it's, artists it's not an get their sponsorships, do the companies find them? Yeah, you... well, no, it's, I mean, sponsorships, just like, you know, the bigger venues or the bigger promoters, sponsorships are attracted by exposure. So if you, if you don't have a lot to offer right away because you're not selling tickets, you're not gonna attract sponsors. They'll come to you once you start selling, you know, 200 to 300, it doesn't have to be much, 200 to 300 tickets at $20 a pop, they'll start coming to you. Yeah, they'll want to, to get your na their names involved, and of course, bigger than that, even more so. All right, quick question. Yeah. Is it better to have a third party representative for you as a artist versus you dealing directly with those who are booking you? Can you give the pros and cons of both of those? Yeah, sure, of course. It really does depend on where you're at in your career. If you're brand new, you're probably not gonna find an agent because you don't have any numbers, any of that history I talked about a minute ago to, to back you up. So you're not gonna attract uh, an agent necessarily, and it doesn't make much sense for you. Agents are very much attracted to people who have really built something for themselves. And a typical, I, we're not typical, but a lot of agencies will ask for a specific amount of markets. Well, if you don't draw at least a couple hundred people in 20 markets, just an example, then we don't want to have anything to do with you. And sometimes they're rude about that, and sometimes they're not. Uh, we as an agency don't look for that trend. We look for more of, more of the future, but we do want you to come in when you've, when you've had the experience. If you're at that point, where, I mean, what's gonna happen then if you are starting to draw like that, like those 20 markets, 200 people, whatever, then you're going to need an agent because you're gonna be too dang busy to, with everything else, really. I mean, I guarantee that. And you're going to attract an agent. And so it's a natural process in a way. I'm not saying that agents are gonna be necessarily knocking on your door, but you could, you probably get more response if you start knocking on their doors, for sure. Yeah, a little. Hey, um, thanks for all this information. It's yeah. really, really great. So awesome. my question is very specific. I just got back from a tour of England, and it's my third time going nice. over there. Yeah. And um, my question is, it, it went really well Good. in terms of, of number of audience and ticket sales yeah. and merch sales. So what do I need to do now to set myself up for success next year and when I get ready to start booking again? And then what should I be saying to those people that maybe said, oh, we don't think you're quite at that level yet to come into our venue. Should I been, be then going back to those people and saying, like, here are the highlights yep. from my last, I mean, Absolutely. how would you package that? Yep. yep. Can, well, if you could break it down or give yeah. me some tips on how to like resell what I've accomplished. Like, how do you do that for clients? Well, you have to be, again, it comes down to the organization. You, you, it sounds like you're keeping track of your, of your numbers, and that's obviously really important. It's important to be very specific. Yep, yep. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I do, I, do. I know, I, I totally mean, how much do you want them yep. to know? I mean, how much is important for them to know? Well, do you, you just can, give them averages? Do you give them, yeah, I mean, I, they don't really probably care about merch sales, but I care. No, no, exactly. Merch sales, I wouldn't so much give to them, I, and, unless that was something that you had, that you felt like you could rely on more, but I would give them the successes of the, what we call the finals. In other words, how many people were in the room. Finals are made up of uh, how many people paid for the, you know, to get into the room, and how many, even how many guests there are. So what you need to do, 
especially I'm assuming what you're talking about is going back to the people who turned you down, said you weren't ready. If you played that same market, London, you know, wherever, Wales, wherever it was, and you, you, you built that history, <clears throat> you can obviously go back to them and say, here's what I did. At this ticket price, give them the ticket price and the number of tickets you sold. That's what they want. And again, doesn't have to be huge. They might at that point say, they're probably just looking for you to get some, tra some traction at all. Like, say I played some shows, sorry, say I played some shows that I did at like a low guarantee yeah. or no guarantee, but okay. I knew there would be my people there. Right. So right, there right. were some shows that I got paid for, some I didn't, some I got low yeah, guarantees, a little, some I got ticket sales. Yeah. A little trickier. Yeah. So, I mean, I think if I, maybe with this idea of the finals, just sharing like, yeah. here was my average audience Not size. Not always going to be black and white. Here's... You know, I've done the average size before. Here's my average ticket price. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that can work. That can definitely work. I think, though, you're also, um, I'm not saying you're not ready to graduate because I don't know what the numbers are, but you'd also remember that maybe it's best to just go back to the same venues that you did last time. I actually just did this with, with, with Galen Lee, actually. She's in the UK right now. And we had, I had one um, London promoter venue come to me and said, oh, she sold out the show last week and the last time. I did like 50 people in that. It's like a 200, 300 capacity room. So, you know, you, you've got to, it's sometimes good to just to go back to that venue and keep building at that venue. And then, again, you're going to have those, those real actual numbers, not just an average, or, but like ticket sale numbers that you can go back to those, those promoters, talent buyers that said no before and give them what they need to get, get the confidence to get you in. Yeah, sure. I'll be able to answer some questions after, although I do want to see Pokey Lafarge. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, my name's Alicia. I'm a part of a group called Damsel and Distress. Um, we're kind of starting out, and uh, I'm just wondering what is really important in that first email that you send, that cold email, mm -hmm. um, what's really important to give them so they actually might read it, so it's not too much or too little? Yeah, that's a great question, and I didn't actually address that, but you need to keep your, you need to keep your pitch really short, succinct, uh, even if you feel like you have like a thousand victories that you want to share, and this kind of kind of goes with your question on the England, on the on the UK stuff, you want to make it as short as possible. Just a little highlight, even if you've never been in the market before. That subject line is really important. We talked about towards the beginning. You know, put the put the artist, put you as the artist, damsel in distress. I think it was in the subject line. The dates you want, the two four rule, no more than four, no less than two available dates that you're available. Even if you're available more, it doesn't matter. And then you repeat that, by the way, in the pitch. We're available these dates. Uh, you, obviously, a link. People ask all the time, should we send a live link? If you have a good, good. Doesn't have to be great, but a decent, good audio and video live clip. Sure, you can embed that. Always embed. Don't send down. Don't send attachments. I think everyone probably knows that. Uh, promoters, talent buyers really get miffed if you send them attachments. Don't do that. Don't, don't uh, gum up their inboxes, but keep it short, keep the body short. I always do an intro, I introduce myself if I'm never in a cold email. Uh, even I'm just Craig from Green Room Music Source, and then I go into a, um, a, a little tiny bit about the, the artist I'm representing, you know, just a couple lines. What are the available dates? I usually put that separate so it stands out, like a separate line. And then the last thing I say is you can find more, or please find music, I invite them, please find music at so-and-so. And I, I am biased, by the way, to Bandcamp. I don't know if anyone else is. I think Bandcamp is the, besides CD Baby, the greatest thing on, in the music industry. Uh, sorry, it was me kissing, kissing somebody. Um, I really, really like Bandcamp because it, there's that giant play button. And what you're trying to do is, is I call it lead the horse to water and, and try to make them drink. You're really trying to make sure that it's as easy as possible for them to you know, to hear your music, and I think Bandcamp is so clean. It's not the only thing, but I, I like it more than SoundCloud, and don't get me started about some other things. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.